Are we good? We're green? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for your attention and uh, for uh, being awake after that very full, satisfying lunch. Uh, my name is Sean Whitcomb. I'm a sergeant with the Seattle Police Department, and I'll be moderating our uh, next session, uh, our panel, where we're talking about just doing real-time communication and challenging events, whether those events be active shooters, uh, arrest of celebrities, or any other crisis communication topics that might happen. Uh, if you can imagine it, uh, it's probably happened in your jurisdiction or in a neighboring jurisdiction. And for us, the benefit is just sharing this information, sharing our personal experiences, learning what works, what hasn't worked, how we can improve for the future. So you know me. Our next speaker is going to be Melanie Snow with the Pasco Sheriff's Office, followed by Vivian Thayer of the Miami Beach Police Department. And thirdly, we will have a Skype guest, Joy Coleman, who is a crowdfunded journalist from California. Without further ado, Melanie. Good afternoon. I am Melanie Snow. I am the Public Information Officer for the Pasco Sheriff's Office. I am one of three within our Community Relations uh, Unit um, that focuses on uh, media response as well as creating community programs. And what I'm here to talk about specifically today is an incident that occurred in our jurisdiction in January of this year, on January 13th, it was one of those quiet afternoons that someone said the Q word. <laughs> it's a quiet afternoon. And um, I get a phone call from dispatch, and all they said was theater shooting in Wesley Chapel, which um, from my office is about a 30 minute drive heading east. Um, Clearly, we've all, um, we're all familiar with what happened in Aurora, Colorado, so when I get a call that says movie theater shooting, I immediately jumped into public information officer mode, preparing for my phone to blow up and uh, my email. So two PIOs, myself and my director, uh, Kevin Dahl, both responded directly to the scene. Now, en route to the scene, I also get another phone call that the shooter may be a police officer. So now we're worried about two separate scenarios here. Is this police officer uh, an active member of our force? Is this police officer an active member of another force within the Tampa Bay area? How many victims do we have? I was hearing maybe two, could be more. Um, this was the opening of a new movie called Lone, Lone Survivor. Uh, it was a matinee, so it was an afternoon. So I had a feeling that the that the crowd would probably not be as large because it was a middle of the day film. So these are all the things going through my head as I'm rushing to Wesley Chapel. Now, just to put it a little bit in perspective, I'm going to play just a couple of the news clips from what happened that day, um, and then I'll tell you more about what occurred and how we handled it as an agency and how we handled it via social media and through the, the press. So this is my sheriff, Sheriff Chris Nacco, and um, this is the first of multiple press conferences we held um, at the scene of the shooting. That is not him. <laughs> Apparently we have a commercial. Can all, can, you can only imagine. This is brought to you by Chick-fil-A. Maybe you can play that out again. <laughs> there you go, you're in. Hey, as long as Chick fil A doesn't pop back up, we'll be in good shape. Okay, so here's the uh, the news clip, as I said, of one of several press conferences that we did. And and rather than as a PIO putting myself out there or one of the other PIOs out there, we figured this was something the sheriff needed to address himself immediately. So. Uh, 
somebody else to accompany with, and if they was sitting in front of him, he was also accompanied with somebody else. During this time, the victim was on his cell phone, he was texting, uh, he was deleting things, some type of noise. This noise led to an altercation between the suspect and the victim. During that altercation, the victim decided, the suspect decided to call a 380 and he shoots the victim. Uh, There's another shot for which he fired at the time. We have two victims. I did the training for the hospital. I do not know uh, how they are at the time. We need to get information all night and send it to you. Um, but I want to make sure we realize that the suspect has been taken into custody. He is being questioned right now. Um, I want to thank everybody um, here at the movie theater. They've been very cooperative. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it right there because at this point we, we have the suspect in custody. You can see there's activity going on in the background behind the sheriff. Um, we positioned the press in such a way so that they could get a really clean shot of the movie theater. We were taking people that were inside the theater out. They were all being questioned by our law enforcement members. What we had was a retired Tampa Police Department captain who, uh, according to witnesses, um, and this is still an ongoing um, case, had fired a weapon at a man inside the movie theater who was there with his wife, uh, and allegedly this was over texting. The, the retired captain was not happy with this man texting during the previews of the film, and an altercation occurred, and um, the, the victim, Chad Olson, was shot and killed inside the movie theater. Um, his wife was also injured because she tried to hold her hand up, and her hand um, was injured trying to um, keep the gun out of out of her face. So, um, immediately what we did is we we got everybody lined up for the press conference, of course, and started to brief the sheriff on what we knew, and we tried to keep the people coming out of the theater because they were all, as you can imagine, shaken up. Um, they were freaking out. We tried to keep them at bay and, and warn them if they wanted to speak to the press, they could. Meanwhile, our third PIO, Doug Tobin, who was back at the office, was um, tweeting, he was Facebooking, but he did something else that I cannot recommend enough to you in the event of something like this that's going to blow up your phones because we're getting calls um, not only from um, local media, but we're getting calls from the networks now. Um, and one TV station here, I swear to you, within five minutes, five people at the assignment desk at the same TV station had called me all at the same time, and they're all sitting next to each other. So I thought that was kind of amusing. Um, so our phones are blowing up. So what we did is we set a, um, a voicemail message on our um, main lines, all of our main lines in our offices, and on our phones with the latest information of what we could provide to the press. So if I couldn't answer the phone, they would get my voicemail, or they would get Doug Tobin's voicemail, and it would say, this is what we know right now. And that would give that radio station, or that newspaper, or that blogger, whatever information they needed to keep moving with their story, because this was this was quickly unfolding. At the time, we did not... Um, we did not know exactly how many victims we had. We thought we had two. We weren't sure. People were coming out. Some people were covered in blood. We later found out that there were two nurses that happened to be there, um, just in the theater watching the film, that tried to help save this man's life. And uh, they clearly were um, were a big get for the press. That the media wanted them. So um, the the nurses did not want to talk at the time. So we had a lot of lot of issues happening at the same time. So what we tweeted and what we Facebooked, I will say in this case, was minimal. It was um, active scene, do not come to the movie theater. If you have a loved one at this theater, um, you know, please contact our office immediately. And we gave phone numbers for people to call so they could find out if their loved one was indeed potentially one of the victims in this case. So. Uh, this was a this was an ongoing issue um, throughout the course of um, the day. It started at around, like the sheriff said, at 1:30 in the afternoon, but it went on until late at night. The media was out there all day, but I can't stress enough how important that voicemail message played in this um, scenario for us because when the phone starts blowing up, and for those of you who are public information officers or who take those calls. 
you can't get to them all. And somebody's going to get mad because you didn't take their phone call, but you can leave a voicemail message with that new information. You're still feeding the beast. You're still pacifying the press and giving them the latest information that you have while you're able to continue to do your job, which is to be on scene. So social media played a valuable role in that. Um, I joined the Pasco Sheriff's Office two and a half years ago. I'm a former journalist. I worked for Bay News 9 here in Tampa Bay for three years. Prior to that, I was in multiple markets. Um, and uh, when I came to work at the Pasco Sheriff's Office, the Facebook page had 900 likes. And we had a little Twitter feed. Um, and so I made it my mission to try to increase that. So now, two and a half years later, we're at 23,000 likes. Our Twitter feed is... Um, is in phenomenal shape. We're over 4,000 on that. We have a YouTube page. Um, we just started an Instagram. We just started a Pinterest page. I don't know how many of you guys have ventured into the world of Pinterest. Um, but the reason we decided to do Pinterest is because Pinterest is a very specific demographic. You're, you're reaching primarily women with that demographic. And, and no, the sheriff isn't posting his favorite recipes, although I've been asked that. Um, basically what we're using it for is um, to post pictures of our canines and um, our SWAT team, which goes over quite well. We also use it to post um, links to um, burglary, um, you know, if, if your home, how to keep your home safe. Um, you know, if you need some crime prevention tips, you can go to Pinterest and find that. So we are trying to use as many different outlets as we can and then cross them over. But Facebook, right now, You'll see we have our officer friendly there with some children, very happy, very nice positive photo. Um, it's that time of year where we really try to push um, showing a different deputy every week or every couple of days and humanizing the people that work for our agency because from the time I started working for the PSO, I knew that that was my primary goal was to take the deputies, the boots on the ground and to humanize them because they are like all of us. They have kids, they have families and they do a job that many of us can't possibly imagine how difficult it is. So once we started doing that and showing photos like this, we noticed those numbers going up. Now I will say there's another way to get those numbers up and uh, um, you guys over at Tampa have probably had some success with this. Um, we, we light them up. If we have a prostitution sting, we post their photos. If we have a major drug bust and we arrest 20 people in a ring, we post their photos. And every person that's ever went to high school with that guy <laughs> gets on there, but they have to like our page first. And they will comment. It has helped us um, make arrests. We started a Fugitive of the Day um, a segment of our Facebook page. So every day we post someone that has a warrant out for their arrest. And um, within the first six weeks of doing that, we arrested 75% of the fugitives we posted because someone went on there and ratted them out. So it's been very successful. And um, that's pretty much it. If you have any questions for me, go ahead and log out here. And we'll have an opportunity for more questions uh, when all the panelists have a chance. Thank you. I'm going to switch some audio and all that other good stuff. All right. Good afternoon. Hopefully everybody's still awake after hearing from one of my counterparts of PASCO. I'm Detective Vivian Thayer, and I'm with the Miami Beach Police Department, as you can see on our icons. We're big into branding, so please follow us at uh, the Miami Beach Police Department and on Twitter. A little bit about me, I'm going to give you a little bit of insight of our department before I talk about our incident. For those of you who don't know who I'm associated with, I'm associated with the Sand, the Sun, and Beaver. That's who I'm associated with. Now, everybody talks about Miami Beach, Miami Beach this, Miami Beach, Beach that, but let me show you something on YouTube because there's a misconception about Miami Beach. Miami Beach is not Miami, it's South Beach. 
LeBron James does not play for Miami Beach, but yet he'll uh, tell you himself. Now he just told you he's going to play for the Miami Heat on South Beach. The arena is not on South Beach. I'll just let you guys know that right now. And that is typical of a lot of things in Miami Beach. CSI Miami is not filmed in Miami Beach. The MacArthur Causeway, I promise you, does not lead to the Everglades. Nowhere near it. You see them going? They're going to headquarters. Headquarters is not in the city of Miami Beach. A couple other things about our agency is that we host special events year round. If, it, if there's a month in the calendar, there's an event. We have Art Deco Weekend, The Bow Show, South Beach Wine and Food Festival, eight weeks of spring break. During those eight weeks, our officers go to enhance staffing because we're only 385 for about eight miles long and 2.5 miles wide at our widest point. With a population of 95,000, which depending on what weekend you come, can increase to about 250,000 overnight. Again, you have, if you've ever, please for all of you who are online, which most of you are, Google any of these events and you'll see tons of pictures kind of depicting what I'm, the vision I'm trying to give you guys. For what we do, there's only two of us. There's myself and Sergeant Bobby Hernandez. My advice to any agency that has celebrities or big time events that come to your city, have a plan. Why? In our case, we get special incident notifications. Anytime there's a robbery, anytime there's anything related to a celebrity, anything with a mass arrest, the PIOs are immediately notified because as all of you know in this room, you're going to get the call. And we've come to terms that instead of telling the media, wait, let me find out, if you could give that beast just a little bit of a nugget, it buys you time to find out more because at that point you don't know anything and you're trying to run around, hey, they're calling me, what's going on in the city? In our case, Florida has a very liberal law, Florida State Statute 119, for those of you who are here from the state of Florida. If you are not a victim of a sexual battery or a juvenile, everything is fair game to the public, to the media, to anyone that inquires about it. So we will typically put together our arrest, our arrest shots, arrest David's our mug shots, and decide, well, what are we going to disseminate when they call us? And don't forget, if you have an incident of national attention, don't forget your locals. We make sure we call, in our case, channel 4, 6, 7, 10, and our Spanish shot, let them know, listen, this is going to go national. We have an idea that it will go national. We're just giving you the heads up, start sending your crews this way. Because with every celebrity that comes to the beach, we've learned to take advantage of the situation. The good. If you have an artist who's doing an off-duty, in this case, and she's filming a commercial for Jaguar, we will capitalize on it. Thank you, Kelly Rowland, for coming to our city and working with Jaguar. And we will at them, we will ask them, and she told us, yeah, sure, because I'm going to retweet you. As a PIO, that's the best news you can give me. You're going to retweet me. Everyone's going to see that Miami Beach has a working relationship with those that come visit. To my friend who mentioned One Direction, there they are. That got us from about 2,000 followers on Twitter. They were filming their new video at the time at the Temple House. We reached out to them. Their security manager was like, you guys are taking care of us. We'll take care of you. How can we do that? Please, retweet me. Retweet me, tell me that our guys are doing an awesome job taking care of the band. And they did. We went from about 2,000 followers to 4,000 followers overnight. Now, you have the good celebrities and then Miami Beach. <laughs> we start going down this little path. I, we, in our office, we joke, we say Miami Beach is sexy. If you can put us in the tagline somewhere in your headline, your newspaper is going to get attention. Your blog, your post is going to get retweeted. LeBron James' mom, Mickey Rorick, Mel Gibson, the guy from Burn Notice. And it's not always an arrest. Sometimes they're victims. And we can't get out of the tagline because here we have Chris Bosch's home who was burglarized in Miami Beach. Once again, it becomes a story. They keep coming. They don't stop. The difference is that, as you can see, in 1999, when Carmen Electra and Dennis Rodman got arrested, it took legwork. You had to chase those pictures down. You had to get that incident report to get it out in a press release. Times have changed. Everyone in here can vouch for that. And it doesn't stop. It doesn't matter if you're in the NFL, 
the NBA, the M you know, the MLB, it, it's just continuously because when you host so many special events, people are going to come. If they're not the headliners at a club, they're the main event. If they're not the main event, they're going to go visit their friend who's the main event. And sometimes when celebrities visit, they do stupid things. <laughs> Which brings me to Florida State Statute 119. When somebody like the Biebs gets arrested, you quickly learn the difference between a B-list celebrity and an A-list celebrity. The day before TMZ, he was arrested on January 23rd. TMZ, who loves calling the Miami Beach PIOs, gives us a heads up on the 22nd. Hey, what are you doing, Vivian? The Biebs, he's, he's writing a segue, and I think one of you, and I go, okay, wait. So the Biebs is writing a segue. How does that affect me? I promise you guys, I was a real police officer at one point. I did detective work, but now Biebs, that's what I'm about. Because we cater to a different audience. I was talking to some of my counterparts before we did our little presentation here. Honestly, we don't tweet about crime because it doesn't happen on Miami Beach. Of course it does, but our audience is different. We are a tourist industry and the city commissioners would freak out if that's all I tweeted about. They care about traffic, they care about construction, anything that affects them. Crime in their eyes doesn't happen in our city. That's nor here nor there for what I do, but for the public it makes a big difference. They don't want a negative light in our city. So TMZ is calling me and I'm like, okay, thank you. I'll look into it if it's our car or not. It was our car. He was segueing down some residential street and we put it to bed and our sergeant, my sergeant goes, you know, he's going to screw up in our city. Nah, sorry, just, just a beep. He's not going to do anything about that. Go to sleep, like all good PIOs. You hope that that phone doesn't ring. I have a husband and a baby, and when that phone rings and they're both at home, this tells me there's a problem. If my phone's ringing at 5.30 in the morning and my sergeant's calling me, this is bad. Hey, Sarge, what's up? Hey, remember who we were talking about yesterday? Yeah. He just got arrested for DUI. Great. Bye, babe. I'm getting ready. DUI. Beaver got arrested. I got to go. Basically, this was at 5.30 in the morning I get this phone call. I didn't make it to work till about 6. My phone started ringing nonstop. Just for the confirmation. All they wanted was a confirmation. And I'll ask all of you guys who are here online to please go on Google, put Miami Beach and Justin Bieber, and you're going to see huge threat. It's nonstop because, I, you know, international Bieber. The day continues. Now we are giving the information and we need to make a decision. I got calls as far as the Philippines. Why they care about Bieber, I don't know, but they needed to know if we had arrested him, what was his blood alcohol content, was he in a Lamborghini or was he in a Ferrari? The priorities here. So we start brainstorming and we say, at this point, there's a huge mob outside of our station because they know that he's still there. Cameramen are posted up by our Sally Port. We're not a detention center, but we have a holding facility. And it looks like, oh my God, every single media outlet, local, network, international, has somehow gotten a cameraman out here in about two hours. Two of us. Some of you guys have bigger departments. Some of you are smaller agencies. We said, let's go out on a limb. The first time we had ever done this for somebody of such stature to keep the beast at bay because we can't give everyone the same information at the same time because our locals want it, the network wants it. Well, why does Fox have it? Why doesn't NBC have it? Put it on Twitter. The entire arrest affidavit, his mugshot. Then we get the positive and the negative. Everyone is happy that they have the information, but the believers are not. The believers are very upset that we have put their chosen one information out there. How can we put his address out there? How can we put his social? How can we put that all out there, his picture? It's time to educate the public. What we did, a follow-up tweet, was to put the state statute, educating them on why we could. We don't hate Bieber. It's not a plan to take his celebrity down. I'm convinced that this helped him. But that's what we did. We put it all up there, and they just couldn't believe it. That's my contact information. That's a little bit of Bieber. I'm sure you guys may or may not have questions. And please follow us all. If you want to look at more arrest affidavit, he was not alone. Yes, he was in a yellow Ferrari, not a Lamborghini. And Bieber is the gift that keeps on giving. If you guys, the one advice that I can tell you, if you have a celebrity arrest, be nice with the investigator that is working that case. Because that case is now yours. 
The second he went to court, he didn't hire a B-list attorney. He hires Roy Black. For those of you who don't know Roy Black, he is now tied into the Desperate Housewives of Miami. So this circle of celebrity just keeps getting bigger, and they continue to reach out for us. And sometimes they don't understand the separation between the state attorney's office. Now it's their baby. No, I can't tell you what they're going to do, if they're going to prosecute, if they're not going to prosecute. We just did the arrest. So it becomes explaining everything that we do because we're completely under the microscope. That's a little bit of Miami Beach. Tons of celebrities come and join us year round. And some are not as important to the world as Bieber, depending on what your opinion is. But we have a plan because you never know when your city is going to host something and one of them is going to slip up. So that's my little nugget for you guys. Are you okay, though? This is what we're talking about. We're talking about social media. We're talking about crisis communication and really leveraging the technology to our advantage as a partner. Cool. I listen to instructions. So, <laughs> so um, just a quick little anecdote. I mean, show of hands, how many people have real time? Uh, have real-time tweeted a significant incident in their jurisdiction. Hopefully just about most of everyone. Um, sometimes it's fraught with difficulty. Sometimes it's uh, something that doesn't turn out to be that big of a deal after all. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, something that happened in Seattle uh, just this past, uh, I believe it was December. And we had one of our uh, mini cruise ships. It's called the Victoria Clipper. It connects Seattle to uh, British Columbia and Canada. It leaves, does like a two and a half hour trip and then comes back later that day. And uh, basically the call came in to me from my on-duty PIO that it had been hijacked in an act of terrorism. So not the call you want to get on a Sunday morning at like 7.30 a.m. Didn't know who was on board, what was going on. I uh, called another one of my staff members. I got in my car and I drove uh, very quickly to work. Uh, we rendezvoused. We got to the uh, the dock where the clipper had originated from. We met with our commanders and we um, watched our other assets and resources respond. And the first thing we did, we, we started putting out information, information that we knew because everything that was happening was in plain sight. It's alongside the Seattle waterfront. You've got this giant ship that is just zigzagging in the middle of Elliott Bay, and people want to know what the heck. And so, and furthermore, what we're doing about it. You have an event like this, are you doing it by yourself? No, you're not. You've got a lot of uh, partners and uh, partner agencies who are working with you towards a peaceful resolution. And in that uh, particular situation, we were working with the Coast Guard, and we were working with the Port of Seattle, which is a, a separate uh, governing agency. They've got their own police department, their own equipment, et cetera. And we you know, formed a joint information center. Uh, we got all the information that we were able to release, and we put out updates in real time as quickly as we could get them. Uh, we quickly learned that uh, it was not a hostage situation. It was just one person aboard the ship. We were able to verify that. So that was good. Um, and as we had new information, we put it out. Uh, we talked about traffic impacts. We talked about the resources that we had. We uh, took photographs and uh, presented them because our audience is a big audience. Is that anyone? who has ever used the Clipper, it's anyone who lives in the city, anyone who was thinking about traveling downtown to the waterfront that day. Uh, it's not necessarily just the people who are immediately impacted. So why take pictures? Because we can, because we're there, we can edit them, we know what we can show, we know what we shouldn't show. If we have a question, we talk to our commanders, right? And uh, in this case, we did. Was the news doing the same thing? Sure they were, and why shouldn't they? 
So we're putting out our own information as fast as we can in real time to keep people educated and informed. Uh, this was a protracted incident. It did not end soon. It took several hours for it to resolve, unfortunately. It turns out we had a gentleman who had uh, dressed as a pirate, snuck on board. I think they left the keys in the ignition. It really happened. Like the guy hit a couple of buttons and got the boat to move, the zigzagging. It was just because he didn't know how to operate it. And he broke into the bar and I think drank a fifth of Crown Royal. So um, we did a funny post because we're Seattle. And uh, I mean, what, that post kind of wrote itself. Um, but it's, it's relevant, it's important, it's happening in real time. It's our information. We're in the front row. We've got it. We know what we can release. We're trained professionals. We're trained communications professionals. We have an audience. And in this particular case, everything worked out great. What happens if it didn't? What happens if there's uh, 300 people on that boat, men, women, and children? And you know, people are terrified because it is a bona fide terrorism event. Um, are people entitled uh, to that information in real time? I would hope so, because if my family was affected, I would want that information. I would want to know what was going on. I would want to know what the authorities were doing about it. I would want to know any update. And what better source than the investigating agencies that are responsible for bringing those types of situations to a successful conclusion? So, I mean, our philosophy, of course, is this is our information, we own it, we have the access, so get it out. And it doesn't really matter if it's an active shooter situation or a celebrity arrest. I mean, and I invite you guys to jump in. You know, we'll circle back on this. We're going to circle back, and let's get Joey up on the screen. Okay, can you guys hear me successfully? Yes, great. So, uh, greetings everyone. I'm Joey Coleman. I'm here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. We're going to keep the screen shared up, so unfortunately you can't see me right now. But what you are seeing is my tweet deck. And this is how I track Twitter in real time. The goal of my presentation here is to give you a basic introduction to a few advanced Twitter techniques that I use to do my work here in Hamilton. Um, if you give me one second, I for forgot to load up one page that I wanted to load up. And this here is a page that Hamilton Police provides all media. And uh, so the password is time sensitive, so you have a FOB issued to you, and you have to get that number in. That was the second part of the number. And this here provides me with a uh, 15 minute delay on this dispatch data and real time on traffic. So. We don't have any active collisions right now, but if there is one that comes up during this presentation, I'll show you how I pull that information. So right now you're looking at six col seven columns. The home column here, which you would all be familiar with, notifications. That's how you track what people are saying about you, of course. This column here is a series of hashtags that are local uh, that people in my area use often. A list, a Twitter list of local media and news sources. This includes the Hamilton Police Service if they're updating. Uh, it's a day where they haven't had to update. This here, column five, is my working column. I'll show you that in a second. We'll start with column six here. And what you can see here uh, is that I'm going to just increase the screen size for you is that this is an advanced search. What it's looking for is anybody using the keywords listed here within 35 miles of a point on a local highway. Um, and so you have a series of keywords that tell people use whenever there's a traffic incident. Um, OPP there is Ontario Provincial Police. That's important to me because whenever somebody tweets about OPP, it is a highway-related incident here in Hamilton. 403 is the local highway. And this is actually one of the terms that sometimes I debate if I'm going to keep it in there because 403 is a common error on the internet. So a lot of my 403 results have nothing to do with traffic, but it does help me greatly to track and know in real time when somebody says the 403 is closed or the 403 is running slow. 
this column here is again traffic related and traffic's important to me as a journalist who covers spot news because any police incident is usually going to have an impact in terms of a road closure or traffic slowdown and this here is a listing of all the major streets in my city so there's an idea for you in your own uh, jurisdiction maybe having a search that monitors all those major streets now let's say that I want to. So this morning there was a incident at the corner of Barton and Sanford and I'll show you down here where somebody t gave me the heads up about it right here five hours ago. So the first thing I immediately do is go into this search and I take out my geocode because I will bring this back in but I want to put it up here and I'm gonna quickly put in Barton and Sanford. Why? Because I'm going to see if there's anything that pops up right away. And at the time that this incident actually occurred, there was really nothing. Uh, you can see here the heads up that this person gave me. You can see that Hamilton police responded very quickly when they saw that I retweeted him and I was looking into it. I know this person. I know they're a reliable source. And then you can see more here. But during an incident, people are often not using both words. They may be using one. So let's put in... Barton or Sanford. And you're going to see very quickly that this search is not very useful to me because it is full of tweets from all over the world that have either Barton or Sanford. So now I need to narrow it down. I need to geocode it. This is bringing this back in. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go to Google Maps. And this is a great thing. The new maps is actually a lot easier to use for this than the old maps were. And so I'm, I'm going to, I normally use the old maps still, so that's why you've seen those pop-ups. Barton and, and Sanford, Hamilton, Ontario. And thankfully it corrects for my little typo. So now it's brought me to a map of this particular intersection, which is a good start. But I need to get rid of this dot that you're seeing in the middle here. So I clear my search, and now I'm going to do two clicks in the intersection it's going to give me the nearest street address. And you'll see right here, what I'm circling around and hovering my mouse over, is the latitude and longitude of this intersection. I'm going to take this, I'm going to remove that space in the center, copy it, and then I'm going to take it into here, my geocode, replace my old location, I'm going to narrow it from 45 miles to 5 miles. I find anything less than 5 miles. Unless you're seeing a flood of tweets, you are risking missing information because people use uh, Twitter, but they have geocode errors. So sometimes your cell phone's not 100% accurate of your location. I'm going to go back to my advanced search here. And I'm going to add the geocode. And now close that off, you're going to see that now it's become narrow. It's become my local area. And you can see here that I'm getting a sense of those same tweets that I saw before. Now what makes this particular location unique, and this is where you get into a limitation, is that the socioeconomic demographic in the area is people live in poverty. It's an area with a significantly below average income. I lived at a block and a half from that intersection for three years. Uh, so I tend to find that these areas I'm not getting as much off of social media. Whereas if it was an area such as near the university, social media will be ahead of the police dispatch portal for being able to give me information. Now, one of the things that I do in the morning is this search tends to get me more information than I need, but this becomes one of my monitoring in the morning is traffic. And so let's do that same geocode. Let's add 20 miles to it and let's put traffic. And you're going to see that you're getting an increase because people will be talking about traffic. We're in the middle of the day, so we're not getting as much of that. But at rush hour, you get quite a bit of it. But once again, you always want to reposition your, your center of your radius. So I'm going to here go and reposition myself at the 403 and QEW in Burlington. This is where I like to monitor highway traffic from. And so I just want to readjust because it's got me a little bit off of where I actually want to be. I'm a bit picky about this. And this is the center of a major interchange between two very high volume uh, highways. Same thing. There I've clicked my geocode. I've put it in. 
I've copied it. I'm going to go back to here, and I'm going to replace this geocode. You're not going to see much of a difference because it's about a 10-mile uh, difference, and there's not any traffic incidents I'm aware of right now. But you can see here that somebody who is in a vehicle or living in the area has been reporting, wow, there was a huge accident. And there was actually a large collision in Toronto, which is outside of my area, but where most of my commuters are going. I want to show you a picture that was up this morning. This was another collision that occurred, and you can see this was about seven hours ago. But at the time that the collision occurred, this was one of the first photos from the scene. And as you can see here, this gives you a sense of how much this collision is interfering with traffic flow. We can see that it's interfering with two lanes. Um, this is just after the tow truck arrives, so cleanup's probably begun. But as somebody who, say, is working a duty desk, this type of search can be very useful for you because, as you can see here, a passenger tweeted a photo of the collision scene. If you are able to find a photo within the first minutes of an incident before your first unit has arrived, or even when your first unit's calling in initial reports, that photo is worth a thousand words. And it's really hard to see over the radio what's happening. So with that, I've given you a brief overview of how to use TweetDeck or Hootsuite as well. It works the exact same. So advanced search and geocoding your searches and able to be able to find information. Thank you. We're all going to kind of share this mic. I mean, that way the YouTube stream will be able to pick up the audio. And and just on a quick note about photos, etc. Uh, I couldn't agree more with Joey. I mean, we are the ones who control the crime scene. We control the access, and when we're at a hot call, um, we're the ones who can get information out quickly via the channels that we choose, the channels that work for us. And what we've seen in Seattle. Um, is that when we take good pictures that help tell the story, that help inform the public, the news will actually grab them. They'll actually grab them and they will post them and they will attribute those photos to you. Uh, we had a murder that happened in a quiet neighborhood just on a street corner. Uh, I was there, uh, put out the information, but I helped tell the story a little bit more by including a photograph of the crime scene, a photo that was tasteful, that didn't show any uh, bodies, that didn't show um, any blood, but just uh, detectives and police cars and crime scene tape. And that helps move the narrative. It shows that your employees are working, they're working hard to solve the case, and that there's action happening. So it's not just a static uh, release of information. This is what's happening now at this point in time. But this is what's happening. This is what we're doing. This is what we're going to be doing. So really using uh, photos and video. Vine is something that we hope to be using more of in the Seattle Police Department. Is anyone using Vine right now? A little bit. Okay. Yeah, it, it takes a little, a, a lot of work. But you know what? I've used it personally. Um, and and. I've also used it in a similar response. We had the big landscape, uh, the landslide in Washington State that shut down one of our uh, state highways, killed over 40 people, uh, wiped out about 50 homes, and uh, I did a ton of buying out there. And it really uh, helps move the narrative, especially when the area or the incident is so close to the public and the news. Just getting little pieces of information out there helps people feel connected to what's going on helps people feel invested in the government response to the uh, situation or the incident that's that's happening. So uh, one cautionary note on uh, photos, and I'm, I won't mention any names or anything, um, but we had another agency in our city where we had a, um, a devastating event. We had a television news a helicopter crash. Uh, both people on board were killed. And uh, some photos went out, and apparently a filter was on, on the PIO's phone, and those photos went out to the public, and there was an accusation that this PIO had uh, deliberately uh, sensationalized the photos, edited the photos, 
uh, to make the incident look a little bit more dramatic. So uh, the accusations weren't true, but those accusations rang out. It was covered by national news. It was a, it was a needless headache during a uh, tragic, catastrophic event. So just be careful about filtering. And you know what? I'm guilty. I'll Instagram, and I might uh, make something look a little bit more dramatic, but be incident sensitive. And, and it's our, all, everything's about context. And you just have to understand if someone's looking at this who's personally impacted, how are they going to feel about this information going out in real time? If, uh, if that's someone's you know, father, mother, son, daughter, how are they going to feel? How is this going to impact them? Um, and once it's online, it's there forever. So um, we make decisions quickly because we're trained pros. This is what we do. Um, but we always have to... Uh, not necessarily abundance of caution, but make a value call as you're moving forward. Not, not to interrupt, we had, I don't know, for those of you who follow football, and on the caution issue, sometimes when it comes to those graphic pictures, we'll hold off and we'll let the media put it out first, and then we'll retweet their picture. So if somebody is offended as by that picture, it doesn't necessarily fall on us. We had a... Um, a fatal accident on the MacArthur Causeway at 395, which is twofold on being interactive with your locals and tragedy at the same time. He is, was a young man, played for the U University of Miami, Jojo Nichols, and DUI involved. The wreck was graphic and violent. When I, once I arrive, the reporter on scene is devastated. So um, it's a little shaken when you're used to speaking to these people, give them the facts and walk away. And Channel 6, the reporter was from Channel 10, tells me, listen, she may know your victim. That changes the, the dramatics of when you go there, instead of just giving her the facts, now I have to wait, find out who my victim is before I speak to her, because in fact she did know the victim. Luckily, the reporter played nice and gathered the information for the cameraman and they were able to go on with their story. She took herself off the story, but now that's the position where do I post that picture? of a car basically embedded into a semi truck. Do we put that do we put that picture out or do we hold off and wait? We know once the media gets there, it's the media's baby, we'll put out their pictures. That way our followers still get the information. But if they feel that it was too graphic on our part or anything like that, we can push it off to well the media already put it out there. It's already on every other major network. And in terms of putting out your own pictures, if you have it, control it. If we go back on Bieber um, for whatever reason, the topic of his tattoos was huge. If you put the information out there, the media will give you credit. All of his tattoo pictures were credited to the Miami Beach Police Department as opposed to TMZ or anybody else that had previous tattoo pictures of him. Do you have any? Well, I, I would also say in regard to, to photographs, as, as a former journalist, now PIO, journalists aren't allowed to put out a lot of the photos that I think people think they can. I mean, I, I know we see a lot of um, things in the press and, and some of them may be a bit graphic, but generally speaking, news directors don't want that stuff on the air. They have a code of ethics as well. Uh, so when I go out to scenes, I take pictures and treat it as though not only am I a PIO now who works for a law enforcement agency, but I treat it as though I'm, I'm a journalist. So I stay back, I stay away from the scene. I get a general photo. Um, I, I try not to show anything that I wouldn't show if I was a journalist, and especially now that I'm a PIO, especially something that would jeopardize the case. And then I go ahead and I tweet it out there and I Facebook it, and I find that immediately it gets picked up by all of the, the and, and not to say the bigger guys or the smaller guys, but the, sm the smaller newspapers, the, the bloggers, the, the ones that are going to call and, and say, hey, I heard something on a scanner, and we've already given them everything they need and and nine times out of ten they even use my exact verbatim in their in their story um, and sometimes I'll throw a really interesting random long word in there just to see if they use it <laughs> so try that sometime and see how many times your word will show up um, but they, they'll take they'll take what you give them and and going back to what you said about uh, maintaining control of the narrative as PIOs, we have an amazing opportunity here to be in control a great deal of the information that goes out. And as a former media member, I can tell you that 
the resources are slim. Uh, my husband's a news reporter. He's a one-man band. Most people are doing. They're out there shooting their own video. They, they don't. They don't have. Yeah, they're using their phones. They don't have um, the photographer and the producer like it was back in the glory days of television. So to get a PIO to provide you with all of these things, a taped press conference or a photograph. You've done their job for them, and they are going to be more than happy to take what you provide and um, you know cut out of it what they need and move on with their day. So you have a you have a great deal of opportunity to to be the narrator of the story and then to prevent it in some aspects from going awry. <laughs> and I think that that's important. I think in the in the time that we're in. Things have changed dramatically. My sergeant, who was there for the Versace case, explained to me, no, the rookie PI goes, whatever you do, make sure the information is as accurate as you can get it, whether it's Facebook, you know, Instagram, make sure that whatever you're portraying, it's what's actually happening. Because in the Versace case, there was multiple agencies. You had federal agencies, you had locals. At that time, we didn't have a fully operational, ready to go on call SWAT team. So the county came in. The county did on their terms what they called an all clear. Well, the PIO at the time misinterpreted that and said all clear. The media ran with it thinking there was not a body inside. By this time, Kunanen had shot himself and there was a body inside of the boathouse. And the first media pickup of that information was that Miami Beach had given the all clear no body. So to retract that information once it's out there is beyond hard. And that's the difference between social media now. They didn't have that where, yeah, if you made a mistake, you can immediately say, we made a mistake. This is the information that is correct. We, so We had a, an incident here recently, um, not in my jurisdiction, but we, we have people that are former journalists that are tweeting news um, in the community. And this particular journalist, former journalist, um, tweeted some information that she had received from a source that ended up being uh, partially inaccurate and um, a couple of news stations did stories about it and how it, you know anyone can be a journalist now um, so it, it's more important than ever to stay on top of the, the message and, and, and like like you said to get the information out as, as accurately as you can um, thinking back to the Boston Marathon bombing you guys know how CNN was so quick to rush to go on the air with they had captured the two suspects before two suspects were even in custody. It's becoming more and more, um, let's get it out there before we check our facts. And um, that puts us in, in an even more important role than ever because um, it doesn't take long for something to go viral and something inaccurate and um, something like we have two suspects in custody after a terrorist bombing is a huge thing to be inaccurate and to have out there. So, um, but the Boston Police Department they they tweeted, tweeted. they they tweeted what happened and, and exact you know exactly what was going on and and people followed them and paid attention to what they had to say. So, uh, be in charge of your message and be accurate and and remember that. Um, the journalists are not always going to get it right. They're they're in a hurry to compete with each other, and sometimes that may mean inaccurate information. And Joey, do you have anything to add? Actually, Joey's gone. <laughs> okay, uh, bye, Joey. I'm trying to get him back here. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, if you get him back, you can jump right back in. And we actually had a fourth panelist today who, unfortunately, was not able to make it via Skype, but. Uh, they were going to talk about uh, the benefits of incorporating social media into uh, training. And specifically, this case was having a social media plan to accompany uh, rapid intervention training. Is everyone familiar with rapid intervention? Hands up if you're familiar with it. So, Because if you're not, I'll explain it. Rapid intervention training. Um, it's... It may go by a different name in other areas. Uh, we use it in Seattle. Uh, it's uh, training people to respond to an active shooter situation. Uh, for us in Seattle, our experience with that training was born out of the Columbine school shooting incident. We wanted to make sure that every first responder, uh, not necessarily SWAT, but every first responder who's on duty has some rudimentary training so that they can go and deal with that type of a situation uh, as safely as possible and um, basically having some tactical advantages 
uh, in confronting an active shooter. I mean, how about, here's another question. How many of you have had an active shooter in your agency or in a neighboring agency? Okay. So, yeah, it's kind of a big deal. We hope it never happens. Um, I mean, honestly. And we've had, we've had a few. We've had a few in our little neck of the woods, and just recently, too. And it, it impacts everyone at, at just a, a level that is just really hard to describe. Um, ordinarily, I mean, you kind of see this adversarial relationship between uh, police and journalists. When you have a situation like that, that adversarial relationship disappears and everyone is concerned about putting out as much information as quickly as possible for the public benefit and public good. And we have to be vigilant for is inaccurate information going out because sometimes people are uh, professional competitors uh, when they are dealing with uh, you know, putting out real-time news. They're relying on sources, but the best source available is you and your organization and your detectives and your SWAT team and your commanders as they're going out and dealing with these types of situations. And, and for us, I'm a cop, 19 years. I don't have a background in journalism. I did study communications at the University of Washington. But with the work that I do now and the work that my team does now is specifically putting out news. So um, presentations yesterday by Julie, and by Laura and, and the, the cut and paste journalism, everything that we do, I mean, the, the day of the news release is pretty much gone. Uh, the day of real time news has been here for the last few years, and the stuff that we do is based on content for the general public that's easy to understand, that answers basic questions. We've been doing it long enough, and we have journalists in house now too, working as part of our team. We know what people want to know. If we can answer the questions, we try to anticipate the questions. We try to get answers to those questions. We try to address as much as we possibly can. We don't like doing updates. If we can answer it now, let's answer it now. If we can answer it in five minutes by making a simple phone call, we're going to do that. We like putting out complete information. We like putting it out quickly. We like getting it to the news. We don't see ourselves as competitors to the news. But at the same time, there's a little pride there because it's ours first. And why would we want a news outlet to put out information that we have access to first? Now, see, I kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I do only because I, th that competitive edge in me is, is still there. But I, I see us as, as a law enforcement agency that also produces news. And if we're going to be producing news that news affiliates are going to pick up, we want it to be accurate. We want it to be the way we want it to be. And um, quite frankly, I like being able to put something out there before giving it to everybody sometimes. I mean, our citizens are what's important to us. And if there's uh, some car break-ins happening in one neighborhood, I mean, I think that's media alert worthy to everybody, but I'll, I'll certainly put it on Facebook that particular community, then the media calls and they're like, well, why didn't you send this as a press release to us? Well, it affected five people and it may affect, you know, more people in this neighborhood. But we're, we're, the world is changing and the days of the press release and the media alert being the only way for a new organization to receive information is over. And um, for the few um, assignment desk people that have said, well, you Facebooked it, but you didn't media alert it. Why did you know? Sorry, check all our outlets now because um, that's the way it is. <laughs> With what she said, we had one of those stories where I knew because in this line of business, you know, your cops learn a news cycle very quickly. It was a busy media day, but our guy rescued a puppy out of the ocean on a boat. We went over, we took a picture. Everyone was busy. Nobody had a live truck available or just a cameraman to come get sound. Okay, so we Facebooked it. One of our locals jumped all over it. And all of a sudden, I started, how could you didn't put a press release out on that? How, how could you? And I go, no, I put it on our Twitter and our Facebook. You, you're not following us? Well, that's your fault. So. Exactly. You, you've got to get them on board. And, and not everything's worth a, a press release. Sometimes it's just a cute little picture of one of our deputies rescuing a cat from a sewage drain. And uh, 
I, I'm, I'm curious uh, for Mr. Coleman. I, I saw that you were a crowdfunded journalist in the description. Yes. Explain what a crowdfunded journalist is, because I know a lot of out of work journalists that probably would want to get in on that. <laughs> so what? Would, would want to know. In fact, they've already tweeted me asking what crowdfunded journalists mean. So. So basically, what it means is that every couple months, I say, "Here's how much money I need to raise to continue doing what I'm doing," um, and people fund me. Uh, so none of my work is behind a paywall. I find that you know. A, you're not going to convince people who aren't willing to pay for news anyway to pay for news because you have a paywall. They're just going to go somewhere else. B, how can you argue that you're working in the public interest if your product is not publicly available? You know, I cover uh, Hamilton City Hall, and there are subsidies in that the city provides space for the media in the council chambers. We have our own desks, our own tables. And so the exchange there is that the taxpayer allows us to use their space in exchange for providing them information. Um, so every quarter I do that, and so far I've been able to successfully fund. It's not going to be the long-term sustainable model. I'm slowly but surely moving people that contribute on a regular basis over to a monthly voluntary subscription plan. It's almost an NPR type model. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> so, so what is your relate, Joey? What is your relationship like to the local authorities as a uh, independent journalist, so to speak? Are they? Well, I mean, is there some sympathy there? Do you get scoops? Um, well, I don't get scoops because I don't want scoops. I actually have a rule. I don't take any embargoed information. I never use the term exclusive. Um, as you saw when I started my presentation, I have access to the police media portal. Every media outlet gets one access, which I'm classified as a media outlet, which gives you an idea of how strong that relationship is. Um, I broadcast every police services board meeting because I feel the police services board falls under the mandate of City Hall, and that's where that relationship started. Um, the key is, is that I'm accurate. I never sensationalize. I tell people when I don't know. And that means that I have a good relationship with police because they see me as a trusted source for information. And I've had staff sergeants call me before and say, I saw you tweet that it looks like a major collision on the Red Hill or that you've tweeted that, oh, it's just a fender bender. And they've been able to take that and get a sense of what's going on on the ground. So that relationship is reciprocal. The same thing. They have to tell me what they know or what they can't tell me they say. I can't tell you or the honest truth, which is sometimes you don't know, uh, and that is fine. That's trusting the relationship between myself, between them, and the general public. I always appreciate when the Hamilton Police Service puts out, we're responding to a call, we're still not sure exactly what's occurring, we will update you. And I think that that's always the hardest thing for police is to say, we don't know yet because I think there's a fear that that will undermine public trust, when in fact what it does is it tells the public, the police are responding, okay, the professionals are there, I don't have to worry as much. So one other question for you, Joey, your, your support base as you, you're basically in a very fiercely competitive environment, I, is it uh, a lot of micro donations, do you have, or is it more, a uh, few more robust donations to keep you going? How, what does it look like? The average contribution to each one of my crowdfunding campaigns is $50 with approximately 250 supporters. Um, so there are some people that give more. I've talked to one person who substantially increased their contribution and they said that the reason they did is they liked knowing that other people had access to that information. Uh, one of the rules I have is first doesn't matter. I happen to be first on a regular basis because of how I use the tools. But never, ever, ever do I say that I was first with information because the second I start valuing that, I start trading off accuracy. Um, people are quite happy to hear me say, okay, other media are reporting this. I'm still working to meet my verification, but I don't disbelieve what they're saying. And I don't mind if it takes me 15 minutes to confirm information that everybody else is reporting because A, people that want that information are already seeing it. B, my role becomes that reassurance of, okay, it is really accurate. Well, you know, I for one uh, appreciate your efforts in the days of media consolidation 
and just uh, fewer outlets and in Seattle. I mean, we're a space that had two major daily newspapers. Uh, sadly, one of them closed uh, and is now online only. Uh, the other newspaper recently went to a paywall model. So uh, just the fact that there are independent journalists out there who, you know, value uh, putting out information and accuracy rather than speed and rather get the complete story than just simply uh, putting out, you know, sensational headlines. Headline. I think that's great. I think that's that's good. Is there is this something that's uh, unique to your area, or are there others in uh, in Canada that are doing this? It's unique to my area in Canada, though there is a non-profit news site uh, called the Taiyi out in BC that is the traditional alt-weekly that has adjusted to the internet well. In the United States, you have the Investigative News Network, and that's a cooperative of nonprofit news sites across the United States, many of which are just great. Um, most are four or five reporters who are trying to figure out how do we rebuild journalism in the online age. And uh, myself, I believe advertising is never going to sustain journalism again. And so we have to figure out a way of getting people to support journalism. So if you have a local news outlet that's part of the INN, they're creditable. They're peer-reviewed. We're a network of people that if any outlet became sensationalist or failed to act in the public interest, they would be booted out. And I know that that's a challenge for you guys as police is there's so many startups out there. How do you verify? And the only way you verify, in my opinion, is based upon past experience. How have they acted in the past? The challenge, of course, being is chicken or egg. Because you've never worked with them before, you don't know how they're going to be. Well. Because And they can't prove that they're going to be creditable because they haven't worked with you in the past. And sometimes it's just that faith. The advantage I had is that a lot of police in Hamilton were familiar with me through my community work. Um, the downtown beat, I live two blocks from Central Station in an area that used to be high crime. So I got to know most of the officers from just being a resident. And so that helped a lot as well. But it's have some faith. Give people a tr chance, and yeah, if they turn out not to be creditable, absolutely, then you can't be dealing with them. So um, I think at this point in the presentation, I think it's great to go to our audience for questions, panelists, Joey. If there's no questions here, I'll start asking some. <laughs> so questions for the panel questions for the panel. So a question that I'd have is access. We talked about putting out our own news. We talked about putting out quickly and accurately. Um, I would say this is probably a little bit more for uh, Melanie and Vivian, but do you have any trouble with access in your home organization, getting information? Are there any obstacles there? How does it work? Talk about it. Um, I don't have any issues because I have direct access to our CAD system, our report system, and our mugshot system, the county mugshot system. Being that I was in Detective Bureau before, it gave me full access and they allowed me to keep everything for the work that I do now, which is the media stuff, whether social media only or PIO interviews with whatever news media comes to us. So it makes it easy to facilitate. Now, that gives me an advantage with the media because the media knows that when they make a request, depending on how bad they burn me or what type of relationship we have, I can either pull that mugshot for you directly or send you to the records custodian and you can sit and wait. So that's an advantage. And same for documents, you know, I asked you, please hold off on whatever information that a bad source gave you. I know what the information is. I may not be able to give it to you right now. Please hold off and you're going to go ahead and report. Okay, when you come back and you request that document, you know what? Do it the quote unquote proper way. Go to the records custodian and you can sit and wait. When he waits, when he gets to you, he'll get to you. As opposed to, hey, your deadline's at four. Oh, not a problem. Here, mugshot A form incident report. Thank you very much. So that's that's an advantage that I have. When I first started, access for me was obviously a challenge. I had come from the alleged dark side. Um, as a former reporter, a world. <laughs> yes, I, um, I I had also covered the agency that I worked for. Unfortunately, at no point had, did I have to do a negative story on the agency that I now work for. Um, but I I have I have 
grown um, my credibility, I believe, in the time I'm there. I also answer directly to the sheriff, so that helps. Um, there is no intermediary between our community relations department and the office of the sheriff, so if I need something, um, I can get it pretty quickly. You find that the biggest issue with like homicide cases? Yes, we, we have a good working relationship with major crimes. Um, and the other thing we've done, and you guys may consider this for your own agencies, we have assigned um, what we call a PIO, Public Information Officer Liaison, to almost every unit at our agency. Uh, major crimes has multiple um, liaisons. There are liaisons on the, on, out on the streets. We have deputies. Um, lieutenants, we have, you name the department, there's somebody there that is working on the side for us as well. And their job is to keep us abreast of what's going on in their unit. Um, the sheriff, um, this was his idea, he wanted this to be something that we do. So he designated those liaisons. Some of them have changed as we've changed um, some positions around and, and people have moved up in rank. Um, but it's a list of about 35 people, and um, we try to get together and have a meeting when we can. And, and those people send us photographs from crime scenes. Um, they send us um, information. So I'm getting things before there's even an incident report. And um, I may get nine photographs of a pot bust on my phone in the middle of the night, which, let me tell you, you know you're loved when you get a bunch of narcotics pictures on your phone and your six-year-old kid finds them and it's like, Mommy, what's that? Why are those guys in handcuffs? Um, so, but I'm constantly getting information from our people at the agency. And so making those phone calls isn't always necessary for me until after they've already told me what's going on. And then it's just a follow-up. So I definitely recommend that. And, and at first, I think there was a little resistance because there is that initial, ooh, should I, you know, I'm a deputy. Should I be taking a photograph of this? But um, the sheriff wanted us to do it that way. And once, um, you know, it's been clear that we can use that that photo, then we're good to go. And it also gives our community relations unit more people working for us to help us get more information out to the community. I mean, you've got a bunch of car break-ins in a neighborhood. The deputy's out there at 2 o'clock in the morning. He can snap a few photos of the cars that were broken into. Immediately, he'll send them to me. He doesn't have access to tweet them himself. But he'll send them to me, and then I'll clean them up a bit if they need it, and then uh, put the information out there. So um, don't don't hesitate to ask the members of your agency to, to help you, because they are the ones that are out there every day. And it can definitely save you a lot of those going through the ranks phone calls <laughs> that you have to make to get to the right person that can help you out, because the media just keeps calling us. So. Right. Um, until we get them something, so it help, it helps eliminate that. I think the hardest part sometimes is conveying to the deputies or the officers the importance of the relationship with the media and the PIO, and the PIO knowing that I know you are tied to this case and it's your baby, but if you don't give me something today, your case is never going to get covered, and that's and that's where that that struggle of just give me a little bit of the video. I know, tell me what you want me blurred out, but if they don't have anything. Don't come to me three days later when there's a double shooting, a stabbing, and ask me to cover something that's no longer news in the news world. It's news to us and it's news to that victim. And it's important. As police officers, we understand the importance, but the PIO sees another side. Just like, you know, please don't put my media three blocks down from the crime scene because that's not good or for TV. Worse, the media that's is going to go to the guy with the wife beater standing in his lawn, and that's going to be their soundbite right. for the evening newscast. And I've interviewed that guy a few times. I know him well. Uh, he knows everything about the crime. He was there. He heard the gunshots. He probably knew everything about the family, let's face it. It's, it's good for major crimes and the PIOs to have a good relationship with one another. Now, we want to protect the case just as much as they do, but it helps us to keep the press from going to the guy that doesn't know anything and gives a sound bite that's pointless and in no way useful to the story or is it useful to the case? I think there was a question on that end. Yes. Yes. Have you ever, so the question is, have you ever called out a news media outlet for getting it wrong and then not uh, Yeah, I mean, I, again, I go back to as a former journalist, I, I read all the stories every morning. I do what's um, called, Doug Tobin, our, our, one of our previous PIOs started this, it's called News Clips. 
we go through and pull all of the, the written stories that involve our agency. We do a Google search under Pasco Sheriff. We pull everything that was written, even if it comes up on a blog. Um, and we also, um, I don't think I've had to do it on Facebook. I usually just call them. Um, if it's big enough, I would have no problem with that. <laughs> it's if been I'm, big enough. We've done it. <laughs> Where we directly will put at whoever that information is incorrect, the following information is the accurate information. Or please see the report that we've posted that you've completely ignored and reported something completely different. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, so if I may, I've actually corrected misinformation myself as another journalist because um, one of our local media outlets has an overnight stringer who everything is an evacuation of a senior's home nearby. And uh, so I often find myself in that role as well. And they're actually quite annoying because I remember a huge fire scene where um, it was the second largest fire we've had in the last two years. We had one that was the second largest in the city, city's history. But we had the stringer telling people that a major senior's building was being evacuated. I knew it wasn't being evacuated, but I have to confirm that with the fire chief and put that out. So right away I, I put out, it doesn't appear to be that way, let me confirm. And then I went and confirmed because what happens is people start tweeting me going, is that true? Is what they're reporting is true? And also I think that as journalists we have that responsibility. If we know information is false, we should be self-correcting to build the public trust in our own trade. So, and question down here. Yes, um, people love dogs. <laughs> they love the SWAT team. They love the SWAT team. Um, so if you have a SWAT exercise coming up, get out there with the camera and take a ton of photos. Um, people love to see. They, they, they like to see the the, the the hardcore action that they can't be a part of. But let me tell you, there's a reason cop shows on TV are so popular. Your forensics people. Um, we recently, um, I found out that our entire forensics team is made up of women. And um, I said, this is a news story. This is fantastic. It's run by a dude, and it's all chicks in here. And they're doing one of the dirtiest jobs that we have at our agency, one of the hardest jobs. And they're going home to their kids. They're, you know, they're planning weddings. They're doing all these things. And they're the ones out there dealing with blood spatter. So I, I just released it to the media as a story. It got picked up nationally. Now they're trying to get me to do a reality show. I got a call from the guy that produces <laughs> The Biggest Loser. I'm like, this is not the real Housewives of Forensics. We can do something else, but that is, we're not going to have that direction. So I would recommend posting pictures of your SWAT team. Um, definitely show pictures of your deputies doing something um, community-based, if they're helping children. Um, if I mean. If, and this is where having liaisons within your, your agency will help. I had a, a deputy who had an owl that got injured, and he helped the owl and had wrapped the owl in a towel inside this car. And it was like sitting in the patrol car, and I just got all these photos. And dorky though it may sound, a thousand likes later, it had been shared another 1,500 times. And I got a call from CNN wanting to know if they could use it as like a little, you know, little thing on their website or on their newscast. So never underestimate the power of animals um, and and good stories. If deputies um, win an award for something they've done in the community, put their picture out there. Um, give them the credit they deserve. But at the same time, you're showing the community um, who works for them, who's out there on the streets, so that that they, they can be humanized. And then also going back to Fugitive of the Day, that's that's been really successful simply because, let's face it, people like to get on their Facebook and they like to talk about each other. You really have to be careful with that because you're going to get people saying things that are inappropriate um, and so you're going to have to make sure you have a social media policy in place and, and that you delete a lot of posts and some of them are going to spam because they use bad words. But um, if we have a prostitution sting, I will post all the photos of the women that we arrested. Now, um, some people may disagree with that. Some people may say that's public shaming. Um, but in Florida, it's public record. 119. Florida 9, 119, 119. is um, <laughs> public record. And we would have released those photos anyway to the press, um, possibly in a press conference, or put a link to send to the media. The difference is I'm just putting it on Facebook. 
So the the import, most important thing about Facebook is activity. Just if you could get a baby on there, yeah, that's your babies, biggest thing. Our biggest retweet was on Halloween. There was maybe baby was like one or two years old. He was dressed as a little prisoner. So what oh. does our officer do? Stands in front of his car with his little prisoner. Something else, and this again <laughs> sounds silly, but and then this and, and when the sheriff told me he wanted to do this, I I, I kind of said, okay, now this is kind of nuts. I don't think I want to go around taking pictures of an elf on the shelf throughout our law enforcement <laughs> agency. This is crazy. And so I took this elf around our agency. I posed him next to the bars in the old jail. I had him driving a <laughs> deputy's vehicle. I set him up on the lights. I had him in SWAT gear. At the end of the day, I was like, this is really the, the nuttiest thing I've done so far. I have never seen so many likes and shares. And <laughs> it was, I, I also admin all of the SRO pages as well. So I shared it with all of them. So that's getting all the parents and the kids. I mean, it went crazy, it went viral, and I was like, this is, and again, I had to go back to the sheriff and say, sorry, I doubted you, <laughs> the elf on the shelf. Can the elf come to Miami Beach this year? He could, he Yeah, could. we may be using the elf on the shelf in Seattle, <laughs> yeah. too. He's going to so. travel a lot this Christmas, People I believe. People especially uh, like uh, the elf uh, holding a giant machine gun wearing the, the tactical <laughs> SWAT vest. That was oh, funny, because no. all you could just see his head. And, so, never underestimate the power of anything. Anyway, question, sir. I was a former TV journalist as well, and uh, in my day, the biggest thing was always deadlines, deadlines, trying to meet the deadlines. How are you all dealing with that? The error of the deadline uh, on by the wayside because of social media and the ability that the information is put out at any time, and if you're communicating in the sense correctly with the citizens of your community, which holds the community's media alert and activity. Um, so I only heard part of the question, but I'm hearing the term deadline, and I'm asking the question back, which is, what's a deadline? Because deadlines, they exist for some outlets, but they're no longer relevant. People expect at 2 in the morning the same response as they get at 2 in the afternoon. It, it, for us, in the, in the incidents that we've had, it's been incident-specific. If you're working on a story that everyone doesn't have the information, then your deadline is relevant. In terms of it just happened now, everyone got it now. Your deadline is no longer important to us, not because you didn't get the information you want. It's because we already put everything we have is already out there. So if you're working on a special project, then your deadline, depending on what it is, if the case is open or closed, we'll take it into consideration. We try to help our media partners as much as we can. Sometimes we get into our back and forth because it may not be releasable at the time, or it can't be released because the detective is holding on to that nugget because they're trying to work on a lead. But we'll tell you, we're honest with you. Listen, if you're someone that I've worked with and you haven't burned me and we're trying to keep that relationship going, it's coming. I can't give it to you right now, but you'll get your stuff. We had it recently with a Best Buy case where we had one channel that was the only one who had it. Nobody else had asked about it. And I was like, just be patient. Arrests are forthcoming. I can't tell you that we're working on the phone in Orlando but I know firsthand the information is going to be made available to you. It does fall on the PIO to keep that relationship. When you have that information, don't burn your reporter and give it to everyone else because then you just ruin the relationship. Yeah, you want to take you want to take care, of, especially the ones that are working on a long form piece that right. you know their deadline maybe isn't today at five o'clock, but it's you want to make sure you keep up with that and. And also, remember to take care of your local people first. You guys have probably heard that already at this conference or at other conferences. Um, having had a few incidents, um, at least during my time at the PIO, we had two men um, last year die in a, uh, they, they jumped out of a plane and their parachutes became entangled and they died um, when they hit the ground. And that was an international <laughs> Um, thing where I was getting calls. These two men were from Iceland. I got more phone calls from Icelandic television stations. I literally got a call from a, a man named Thor at 3 o'clock in the morning and, and, and had to ask, really? Um, but yes, this Yeah, well, that's him. And he, he called me a number of times. We developed a great relationship because this was an ongoing thing for weeks. Um, but my point is, with that particular story and with other things, you want to take care of your local press first and make sure that they get what they need before you go running off to the Today Show. And because 
the Today Show will, you know, and, and the networks, they're going to they're gonna hound you. They're going to have, like when uh, we had a th movie theater shooting, I didn't get one call from CNN. I got 15 yeah. phone calls because you know how many different CNNs there are? There's, there's like 10 different shows in one day on CNN, and each show producer called me. So um, I wanted to make sure that I took care mm -hmm. of Channel 10 first and, you know, our, our local guys. On certain things, now, everything else we tweeted and Facebooked, so that the deadline issue really is a case by case basis. So we've got five more minutes, so we'll take uh, one more question, folks. Hey, Joey, do you have anything to add? Any closing remarks? Um, my closing remarks will be: remember that you ultimately serve the public interest, so never embargo information that the public needs. I remember doing a presentation to media officers from numerous forces and one of them said we em we embargo ourselves for 15 minutes we give it to the media before we put it on our Facebook and Twitter and that'll undermine public trust at the end of the day people are more savvy than ever before and they know if you've given it to the media and they feel the media is an intermediary between you still a very important intermediary but you need to keep that in mind <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Did I come to Florida? <laughs> uh, no, I just thank you for your time, and um, I like our Facebook page, Pasco Sheriff. Um, but if you ever need anything, feel free to, to Facebook me or email me or message me, text me, call me, anything, and I'll be glad to give you any kind of advice or tips. Um, I Again, I'm, I'm still new at this. I'm two and a half years in, but in that time, I... I still lean a little bit on the journalism side, but find myself more on the law enforcement side now. I've even, I'll be finishing a criminal justice degree in December, decided to, um, to learn more about where I currently am and what I'm doing. So I became crime prevention certified, and, and I think that, that's also important because you have built credibility with the press in your new role. And, and I can answer questions now um, from a law enforcement standpoint as well as how to handle the media, so um, I can't recommend learning more enough. Take the classes, take the trainings that they're offered to you, um, conferences like this, anything you can go to to, to add more information to your, to your brain. Because <laughs> it's changing very quickly every day. There's some new uh, social media outlets, and we've got to keep up with it. If you guys have any celebrity-related arrests or major incidents in your city that you Sending may them to right, no, please keep them. Canada, I know you're in here. Please keep Beaver on your on your side of the border. Yeah, you might uh, that keep job. keep border. Uh, but, um, I was happy to I was happy to give them to you. Yeah, that's what the world thinks. <laughs> we have major event period planning books that we've done from events that we have year-round throughout the calendar year in our city. If you need any little bit of nugget information regarding that, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Feel free to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, at Miami Beach Police Department on Facebook and at Miami Beach PD on Twitter. And again, it's ever-changing and ever-needed. The news is not going anywhere, and social media is not going to stop growing. So if you're a smaller agency or a bigger agency that doesn't have it, you're late. So jump on the bandwagon and embrace it. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. And what's next, Lori? We have a half-hour break and dessert coffee. Woo! So, sorry, I wanted to show something here, if I may. Uh, I forgot this. This here is don't be fooled by size. This here, which is in front of my face, about the size of my face, is my live rig. This is the camera. This is the modern-day satellite truck. So don't assume that because it's a small camera, it's not professional. And be prepared. If you see a small box on top, you can be live. So. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Always, always imagine that microphone being on. When you're you're always live. Always live. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.